I hope that uh, you'll take a minute when this service is over. I told you last week about the whole uh, Ecuador project and how our student ministry just came up with an amazing way to communicate the needs that are going on in La Violeta and the community that surrounds it. And it's all set up here on my left side, your right side. So after the final song, all the house lights will come up and you can just take a minute and kind of begin on this end and walk through. And for kids, there's kind of experiential things that they can do. If you want to get your kids and bring them back through, you're welcome to do that between the services. It's just a good way to get a better understanding of what it means to step into this community that has been so disadvantaged for generations and how you're giving, how our sacrifice is making a huge difference. I did talk to the National Director for World Vision in Ecuador this past Thursday. We Skyped for a while, and he was so thrilled when I told him about what these different elements were and how we're trying to connect our heart with what's going on there and how we're trying to get our people to really sacrifice, make a difference, to continue this project both there and the project we're doing in Nigeria. So between now and the end of the year, please give the money, make a difference, know that this goes so much farther than a toy that is played with at Christmas time and forgotten about tomorrow. You're giving people a chance to get out of poverty by giving them an education. So I've been praying a lot for this service. I really know at this time of the year, it's especially challenging if you're going through difficult times. I'm reminded of something that uh, a young pastor came to D.L. Moody. D.L. Moody was a really well-known evangelist preacher and, and came to Mr. Moody and said, Moody, I don't understand, you know, why it is that every time you preach, people give their life to the Lord. And Moody looked at the young man and he said, well, you don't expect that to happen every time you preach, do you? And he said, no. And he said, that's your problem, that you don't expect it. And so I've really come into this whole series with this expectation that we're going to preach Jesus and we're going to talk about why he actually came and that he wants to know people. And I believe and I expect that people who walk into this place today that don't know him are going to come to know him like they never have before. So we're in this series, we're talking about Jesus through the eyes of the different gospel writers. You know, I was thinking about the stories, many of the stories we love, and almost all of them begin the same way. Once upon a time in a land far, far away. And they tend to end the same way. And they lived happily ever after. Sometimes the way we tell the Christmas story takes on that kind of dreamlike quality where you half expect the pastor to get up and say, once upon a time there was a young maiden named Mary who fell in love with a handsome young carpenter named Joseph. But that's just not the way it happened. And it's not the way the story's told. So our challenge at Christmas time is to take one of the best known and best loved stories of the Bible and strip it of that once upon a time feel to return it back to the nitty gritty reality of when it actually happened in the first century. Bottom line, I sincerely believe both church and society have distorted the Christmas message. I mean, just think about, think about what surrounds us at this time of the year, from movies to music. Almost everything we see and everything we hear paints this season as the happiest season of all. But if you find yourself going through a difficult circumstance, all those cultural expectations tend to compound whatever misery you might be feeling. Because it's really hard. It's hard to be grieving when everybody else is telling you to be happy. It's also very difficult to be going through a challenging time and be going uh, through a time very alone, not connected to others, and be surrounded by all these images of idyllic families. Personally, I think we've lost connection with the soul of Christmas. We've so sanitized and sentimentalized the Christmas story in the Bible that it's lost its ability to connect with people in real pain. But what you're going to see today is the Christmas story is a message of radical hope for anybody who's ever felt forgotten, left out, or just in pain and all alone. We need to reclaim that story. We really need to rediscover it because now more than ever, the world needs to hear it. You see, when we distort the image of Christmas, we distort the image of God. We give the impression when we only tell this story in hushed tones, we create an otherworldly fear. It causes people to think that the only place you can find God are in sacred and special places. And that's not true. You can find God in messiness and in deep pain and profound loss. 
Think about it, friends. If the only place we could find God was in the quiet, sacred moments and only among really special people, most of us would be in deep trouble, wouldn't we? Because that's not our world. That's not where we live. And the first Christmas doesn't happen when all is calm and bright. It actually happens when everything is dark and chaotic. And if you can find God there, you can find God anywhere. He comes to us where we are. And that's the message of Christmas. So our focus all month long has been on Jesus, just Jesus. We said we want to behold him, which means we want to really know him. We want to absorb him. We want to experience him. And we want to be changed or transformed by him. Now, Matthew gives us an image of Jesus as the rightful king. Mark comes along right after him and says he's the suffering servant. Luke paints Jesus as the son of man. And by the way, that's Jesus' favorite way of referring to himself. He calls himself the son of man more than any other term in the gospels. Look at this verse in Luke. This is Luke 19.10. For the son of man came to seek and save what was lost. You'll notice there's three words that are capitalized in that verse because that happens to be the outline of the gospel of Luke. Jesus he comes, he seeks, he saves. So the first part of Luke is about Christ coming into the world. The second part of Luke is him about about seeking those in the margin, the hurting, the broken, the people who are looked over in society, and then finally he saves, and he saves by means of the cross and the resurrection. This is Luke's message in a nutshell. Before we get into the message proper, though, there's some things that are really unique and distinctive about this book I just want to point out. If you want to understand how much Jesus values women and their leadership, read the Gospel of Luke. Because Luke highlights the role of women in the ministry more than any of the other gospel writers. Not just that, Luke also highlights the Holy Spirit more than the other gospels. You see, a lot of Christians mistakenly believe that the Holy Spirit didn't come till Pentecost. And that's not true. The Holy Spirit has been working throughout all of history. He just came in a unique and a permanent indwelling sense in believers at Pentecost. Luke also mentions Uh, uh, the childhood of Jesus. If you want to know the only recorded incident of Jesus as a kid, you find it in the gospel of Luke. But the thing that makes it my favorite gospel of all is Luke is the gospel of the poor. Now, I don't know if you're aware of this or not, but if you've ever studied uh, literature of antiquity, really ancient books, the Bible is truly unique in this way. Most books that have been written throughout history have championed great leaders and great nations and told of their successes and all their exploits. The Bible is really unique because it's the one book that dares to put the common men and women at the center of the story. That the poor are really important in the story that God has been telling for all time. And there really is no other ancient book in history that dares to do that, especially like the Gospel of Luke. Now the last thing you should know about this book is that it's Luke's version of the Christmas story that gets told most often at Christmas time. Now you might be tempted to think that because it gets told so much, we would know this part of the story best of all, and we would tell it really well. And that's not really true. We've distorted even the message of the gospel of Luke. We've sentimentalized it to the point that we no longer hear the heart of the story. So what I want to do this morning is I want to walk us back to three of the main players in the Christmas drama. We need to rediscover Christmas the way Luke tells it to us. And the first Christmas, it does happen in the midst of chaos. And Luke, I want to show you because he introduces us to the mother of Jesus, to Mary. And I want to talk to you about her in her pregnancy. Not the part where Joseph is doubting and maybe wondering if Mary has been unfaithful and had a baby by another man. But I want to talk to you about her expectations as a mom. Because we pass over this part of the story and it's really important. So this first point I call Mary the cry of the broken. What Luke does is he gives us a unique behind the scenes kind of glimpse into what's going on in Mary's heart and her mind. So she sings a song that Luke records, a song about the son that she's carrying within. But this woman is not like most first-time expectant mothers. This song is not about the joys of having a baby. This song is not about the color of the nursery walls. This song is not reminding Joseph that you have to get up with a baby at night too. Okay, it's nothing like that. What she sings about is not the joys of having a baby but about what her son would be. She sings about what Christ would become 
as an adult, as a man. So it's this song that's going to change the course of history. And I want you to hear what she writes. She says, my soul glorifies the Lord. And my spirit rejoices in God my Savior, for he has been mindful of the humble state of his servant. From now on, all generations will call me blessed, for the mighty one has done great things for me. Holy is his name. His mercy extends to those who fear him from generation to generation. He's performed mighty deeds with his arms. He's scattered those who are proud in their inmost thoughts. He's brought down rulers from their thrones, but he's lifted up the humble. He's filled the hungry with good things, but he sent the rich away empty. He's helped his servant Israel, remembering to be merciful to Abraham and his descendants forever, even as he said to our fathers. Now, Mary's song is commonly referred to as the Magnificat. Magnificat is an, a Latin word. It comes from the Latin translation of the Bible. And the very first line of this song is Magnificat, which means my soul magnifies or my soul glorifies the Lord. Mary, what she's doing in this song, like I say, it's no nursery lullaby. This is a song that has spiritual dynamite to it. It has meat. It has substance. Mary's got a grasp on reality that eludes most of the people around this narrative. She's telling us that a system's going to be overthrown, that a way of life is going to be challenged, that powerful rulers are going to be defied. What she's doing is she's using the language of protest. Listen to this line again. He scattered those who are proud in their inmost thoughts. He's brought down rulers from their thrones. Let me tell you something, tyrants don't like songs with lyrics like that in them. Those are a challenge to everybody who grasps and holds on to power at all costs. She goes on to say, he's lifted up the humble. He's filled the hungry with good things, but he sent the rich away empty. Read the oppressor, read the powerful. Today we call this sticking it to the man. Okay, that's what she's doing in this song. She's sticking it to the man. Not only that, this song is so radical that in the 1980s, in the country of Guatemala, the country outlawed the public reading of the Magnificat. It was deemed too politically subversive because people who abuse power don't want others to hear messages like this or believe messages like this. Can you imagine Mary, after writing the words to this song of praise to God about what her son would be, that someone would tell her 2,000 years from now, your words will actually terrorize tyrants to the point that they will forbid that your song be read out loud. They will be so fearful that people will believe these words, believe that God is on their side, and believe that those who abuse power, that their days are numbered, that they won't even let your words be spoken. In the Magnificat, God reverses everything. He takes those who are on the bottom and he puts them up on the top. So think about the Christmas message and how it echoes this story. When God sent his son into the world, he picks an unlikely girl to be the mother. He chooses a forgotten province in the Roman Empire. He arranged so his son would be part of a hated race of people. He found the most unlikely hometown, arranged for his son to be born in a stable and take his first nap in a feeding trough. Jesus was born that way, to send a message about how God does business. He doesn't run with the rulers. He doesn't side with the rich. God is at home with the humble, the tired, the weak, and the lowly. You know, if the Bible teaches us anything at all, and if the Christmas message says anything at all, is that God is on the side of the poor. God is on their side because no one else will. He takes up their cause because no one else will stand with them. He fights their battle because no one fights for them. He lavishes special attention on them because the world neglects them. The same is true for the hungry, the hurting, the discouraged, the homeless, the depressed, the disabled. God is on their side too because if he doesn't stick up for them, who will? You see, if Jesus were born today, he would not be born in Highland Park. He'd probably be born in a crack house in West Dallas. I mean, I'm serious. I mean, this is what the story is saying. We just put it in our own context. This is what Mary is praising God for, that God does the unexpected. I mean, literally, whether you realize it or not, Jesus, when he came, he started a revolution where all the outcasts are made welcome. People that can't get along come together in the family of God and they get along. The hungry are fed. The sick are healed. The lonely are brought into family. We have forgotten that we've been called to a revolution and we've reduced the great big gospel to a church service. 
So as you read Mary's song, you pay attention to something. There's a, a change in verb tense. So especially all my teachers in the room, you probably already noticed this. When Mary speaks of herself, she speaks in present tense. When she speaks of her son, she speaks in past tense. You might have noticed when it talks about Jesus, it says he has performed, he has scattered, he has brought down, he has filled. Now what's up with that? I mean, this song is about the he that she's referring to is her son, Jesus Christ. And at this point, Jesus is still growing in her womb. How is it that Jesus, she can speak about Jesus as having already done all these things when he hasn't even been born yet? Well, what Mary engages in is what grammarians call the prophetic errorist. If you've ever read the Old Testament, you see this all the time, that a prophet is given a vision of the future. And when they begin to describe the future, they speak of it in past tense. Why? Because God said it would happen, the prophet is sure it will come to pass, though they speak about it as if it had already happened. Does that make sense? So Mary is joining the long and, and, and well-known line of prophets. She's speaking in a prophetic way that she knows her son, based on the promises of God, will accomplish all of these things. It will happen. So she speaks of it as if it's already happened, which means that Mary is a prophet, and she is speaking prophetically. You know, there's this song that's sung at this time of the year. A lot of people really love it. I like it, too, a lot. It's a great tune. It's called Mary Did You Know. Have you ever heard it? A lot of people love that. I have it on my iTunes, but you know it's bad theology. It really is. Mary does know. Read the Magnificat. She understands what her son will accomplish. She speaks about it as if it had already happened. The more appropriate question is, Joseph, did you know? I mean, that's the question we should be asking because Mary really gets it. And by the way, when we say that and we sing that song, what we're doing is a disservice to Mary as a prophet. We're speaking to her and putting her in this maternal, okay, you're just dreaming about your little baby that's going to be born. There's nothing in Scripture that suggests that. She is speaking and thinking prophetically about what her son will become. So let's dive a little deeper into Luke, into the circumstances under which Jesus is born. Because you see, Mary has done this song about rulers being deposed, about rulers being brought down, and the poor and the humble being lifted up. So the appropriate question is, who's in power now? And what are they doing to the poor? And Luke is going to go right from that song into introducing us to the political reality of Mary's day. I call this next point Caesar Augustus and the oppression of the empire. In those days, Caesar Augustus issued a decree that a census should be taken of the entire Roman world. And everyone went to their own town to register. So Joseph also went to the town of Nazareth in Galilee in Judea. He went there to register with Mary, or he went, he was from, I'm sorry, he was from the town of Nazareth in Galilee to Judea. He went there to register with Mary, who was pledged to be married to him and was expecting a child. While they were there, they came, the time came for the baby to be born, and she gave birth to her firstborn a son. She wrapped him in cloths and placed him in a manger because there was no guest room available for them. So of the four gospel writers, only Luke records the actual birth of Jesus. And as he records this, the story is told in such a way that you know the world is on the move. The, the emperor over all of Rome, Caesar Augustus, has demanded a census. And of course, you know what censuses are really about. It's not just getting an account of your people. It's getting an account of your tax base. And what this is going to lead to is that Caesar is going to begin to tax all the client states that are in the empire. And he wants to have a good accounting so that he can know the numbers when they come in. It's greed that's fueling this census and causing all types of hardship. You see, what made this census so challenging was this additional requirement that all people return to the town of their birth to register. So this is highly inconvenient. But it's a reminder to Israel that though they're in the promised land, they are not really free. They're under the pagan Roman Empire and what, what Rome demands, Israel must comply with. So Luke tells us that Joseph and Mary, they made their way to Bethlehem, the town of their birth, which would have been at least a three-day journey of 60 miles. Luke tells us this journey to Bethlehem is upwards because... Bethlehem sits at 2,704 feet in elevation. This made the journey all the more difficult. Can you imagine hiking up a mountain when you're nine months pregnant? 
Now, a lot of our movies we like to watch at Christmas time show Mary riding a donkey, and that's really all wonderful and good, except the Bible doesn't say that. There's no donkey in this narrative. And given the extreme poverty that they live under because of the gift they give with the birth of their son, which is just for the poor, they probably don't even own a donkey. So, so Mary's hoofing it every step of the way. Think about this. The Susan B. Coleman race for the cure, 20 miles a day for three days straight, right? That's what they're doing. But they're doing it without Nikes. They're doing it uphill all the way. And they're doing it when she's nine months pregnant. This is what Mary and Joseph are enduring. And when they arrive, as if to add insult to injury, we're told there was no room in the inn. So like Mary and Joseph, many others have been forced to make this pilgrimage back to their hometown. So a tiny village like Bethlehem is crammed to the max. I mean, it's just over full, crowded streets, long lines at the market for food, every extra bed in the city already spoken for. So Luke tells us the best place that Joseph could find for Mary to give birth with some measure of privacy was a stable, which was likely a cave in the side of the hill that was used to house livestock. There are no midwives that are mentioned, which means in all likelihood there was no one to assist Mary with the birth. That's highly unusual, but it's highly unusual times. Due to the upheaval and the chaos around them, most likely Mary gave birth with the husband Joseph alone. Ladies, can you imagine giving birth with just your husband as the assistant? I've been, good luck with that, Brenda. You know, I don't know what to do here, right? So, follow me here. A pagan king makes an irrational decree forcing all people in the empire to comply. The whole known world is on the move, creating a stress on everybody's resources to the limits. In the midst of that chaos, a pregnant woman has to make a long and arduous trip into the mountains only to have her child far away from home, any support system in the most primitive and difficult circumstances imaginable. And Luke wants us to understand that all of this suffering and all of this difficulty has a point. That even though God did not wish all of these terrible things on them, God would use those things to make sure that his son was born in Bethlehem, near to a group of shepherds who would have no trouble finding this Christ child. Because when the angels announced, go look for the baby that's born in a barn, believe me, that kid's going to stand out. Because babies aren't born in barns, They're not wrapped in swaddling clothes. They're not lying in an animal's feeding trough. So when the the shepherds come, they're going to know who this Jesus is. And remember, everyone around Mary and Joseph are suffering too. This decree, this forced travel is hurting everybody. It's hard to keep suffering in perspective, isn't it? Because when you're going through something difficult, it's just right here. It's here. It it dominates your perspective. It eclipses even God. We get so focused on the suffering that we can't see anything else. We live in a real world. We live in a world where there's unfairness, where there's brokenness, a lot of circumstances filled with pain. That's why it's important to tell this story and tell it well. The first Christmas story is about pain and hardship and agonizing questions. We're often tempted to think that nothing good can come out of suffering. And I'd be tempted to agree with you if it weren't for the fact that I believe in God. And if you don't factor God into the equation, maybe nothing good can come of suffering. But here's something I find fascinating. Recently, there was a survey done of thousands of Christians across the USA and asked each of them, what was the time in your life when you grew the most spiritually, when you experienced the most personal spiritual growth? Their answer was not transformational preaching and teaching. So evidently my job is not that important. It was not being involved in a small group and in community. So evidently Pastor Josh's job is not that important. It wasn't great times of worship experiences and singing in church. So evidently Pastor Eric's job is not that important. It wasn't finding ways to serve and connect with children. Evidently Pastor Tammy's job is not that important. It was pain, adversity, difficulty. We don't even have a pastor for that. I mean, I don't even know what we call that. You know, the pastor of disaster, I guess, right? (laughs) Sounds like a wrestler's name. 
People said they grew most during seasons of loss and pain and life-altering circumstances than any other time. Now, you and I know that adversity doesn't automatically produce growth, does it? Because abuse and pain and loss and ghettos scar as many people as it does bring about transformation. The question is, do you run from it or do you run to God? Do you find God in your suffering? And that leads to this last point because this is what Mary and Joseph find. Here are the shepherds, the excluded are now included. So Luke continues this story. We've seen Mary and her song of defiance and what Jesus will accomplish. We see the, the king who's in charge, who's doing all these terrible things to the people of God. They're suffering tremendously. And now we come to the shepherds. And this is Luke 2, 8 to 14. And there were shepherds living out in the fields nearby, keeping watch over their flocks at night. An angel of the Lord appeared to them, and the glory of the Lord shone round about them. And they were terrified. But the angel said to them, do not be afraid. I bring you good news that will cause great joy for all people. Today in the town of David, a Savior has been born. He is the Messiah, the Lord. This will be a sign to you. You will find a baby wrapped in claws and lying in a manger. Suddenly a great company of the heavenly host appeared with the angel, praising God and saying, glory to God in the highest heaven and on earth, peace to those on whom his favor rests. Now I don't know if you're aware of this or not, but by the time Luke writes this, this is the first appearance of the angels in the Bible in 500 years. There hasn't been an angel on the scene. And this is not just any angel. This is Gabriel. So Gabriel appears to Zacharias, and he appears to Mary. And now this time the angel is unnamed, but it could be Gabriel back for a third visit. When an angel shows up in the Bible, there's always a formula, if you will. There's always a set of things that happen in this order. And here's what happens every time we see an angel in the Bible. They appear, there's fear, there's comfort, there's a message, there's a sign. That's always a sequence. It lines up every time when you read about angel encounters in the Bible. So the shepherds are there just watching their sheep, doing what they do, when all of a sudden there was nothing and now there's an angel. That in itself would scare me to death, right? Right? Nothing there, now there's an angel there. But this is what angels do. They show up, they show up unannounced. And the Bible says that they were terrified. Literally in the Greek it says they feared with great fear. And right after that, this, this explosion of angels happens in the heavens. And the Greek word there is murion. And murion is kind of hard to translate, but it was the highest numbers that the, the, highest numbers that the Greeks could count to. This is their way of saying that the number of angels that fill the sky were incalculable. It was, you couldn't count the number of angels that were there and proclaiming this message. But there's one aspect of this story that doesn't shock us, and it should. There's one part of this story that doesn't hit us like a ton of bricks. And that is, why were the shepherds chosen as the first recipients of this amazing news of God's arrival on this planet? I mean, if you were a PR agent and arranging for the Son of God to make his entrance in the world, the last person you would ever choose is a shepherd. Now, we don't understand that because we romanticize shepherds. We think about King David being a shepherd. We think about Psalm 23, that God's a shepherd. We see Jesus calling himself the good shepherd. We see our kids in Christmas programs, in their bathrobes, in their towels, playing shepherds, right? So we romanticize it. But in the Bible, they were not romanticized. In fact, one of the reasons they were looked down on so much, especially by the religious leaders, is every single day they took care of their flocks. So guess what rule they violated all the time, according to the Pharisees? The Sabbath. They didn't observe the Sabbath. But you can't if you take care of animals. You don't take a break from caring for animals. Animals still have to be fed every day. They have to be watched out over. And so the religious leaders looked down on them because they said they profaned the Sabbath all the time. They were on the bottom rung in terms of the Palestinian social ladders. They were right up there with dung sweepers and tax collectors. Shepherds were despised. We have this really old book called the Mishnah. And the Mishnah is a recording of Jewish written oral law. And in that book, shepherds are called incompetent. In that book, we're told if you found a shepherd and they'd fallen into a pit, just leave them there. Don't help them. You were never to buy wool or milk or even a baby goat, a kid, from a shepherd because it was considered to be stolen merchandise. Shepherds weren't allowed to give testimony in court because people believed them to be liars and utterly untrustworthy. So, in short, shepherds were seen as thieves, liars, and lowlifes. 
So the first people who heard the message of the birth of God's son were the most despised, untrustworthy, unworthy, marginalized people in that society. The Christmas story is a cameo of the gospel. The Christmas story is a cameo of Mary's song. The excluded are now excluded. The people on the bottom have been brought to the front of the line, haven't they? I don't know about you, but that gives me a lot of hope. The most important message the world has ever heard was delivered to an insignificant bunch of shepherds. God did this to demonstrate that he cares for people who've been overlooked and trodden down and beat up by the world. If Christ came to bring deliverance and salvation to those people, then why not announce it by the same means? You see, Mary's song is already beginning to materialize. That's why in Luke's gospel, the poor and the women and the shepherds and the marginalized are at the very center of the story. Because Mary's already talked about, this is what would happen. The people who are last would be first. The people on the bottom, they're on the top. But you see, this is the first time that Mary and Joseph have had outside testimony that everything they've been told by God is true. And God brings that through the shepherds. It's an amazing affirmation that somehow this suffering has had a point. That somehow even going through this difficult time, God is showing up and he's redeeming. Now there's one more thing I have to tell you about why this is so important to God. Why God is in, invested so deeply in the great inversion and in turning society upside down or more importantly turning it right side up. To make sure that people who've been forgotten and beaten down and are lonely know that they really matter to God. And it's a story about a sociologist in our history, one of the best known and, and highest respected, one of the greatest sociologists in the United States was a guy named Willard Waller. Now, if you have the last name Waller, I don't know why you'd name your son Willard, but they did, okay? And that's not the worst of it. Guess where Willard Waller was from? Walla Walla, Washington. So <laughs> Willard Waller of Walla Walla, Washington. I'm not making this up. You can look it up on your own. A, welly, a really well-known sociologist. <laughs> so he, he made a very interesting observation. This is, this is serious, okay? This is, the, this is the principle. Among human beings, there's an inverse relationship between love and power. In other words, in any relationship between human, two human beings, it's the person who has the greatest love who has the least power. Now, you know this to be true, but let me give you an example. Quick show of hands on this. I want your participation. How many of you have ever been in a dating relationship or a marriage where that person you were in relationship with was less interested in you than you were in that person? You loved that person more than they loved you. Can I just see your hands real quick? Okay, keep your hands up for a minute. Look around. All the people who are not raising their hands have a serious psychological illness that we're going to diagnose. <laughs> no, I'm, I'm kidding. I'm kidding. So... If you've ever been in a relationship where you love someone more than they love you, did you enjoy that relationship? No, you didn't. Why? Because the other person held all the power. If I'm in a relationship, I'm deeply attached to somebody, but that person's not deeply attached to me, I call all the shots. If I want the relationship to be over, I walk away unscathed, I don't get hurt. If they don't do what I, they want me, I want them to do, I can just leave. I hold the power because I don't care like they do. Ask any couple where one partner wants to get married and the other doesn't who holds the power. It's the person who doesn't want to get married. You see, what I'm saying is, is to love in any way is to make yourself vulnerable and weak. When you really give yourself to love another person, sometimes you endure a certain level of pain and suffering because you love. Amen? We do. We, we, we go through some pain and suffering. Not that we wish it, not that we want it, but when you love, you're vulnerable. You're vulnerable, you're woundable when you love. So here's what I want to ask you. In the relationship between God and human beings, who holds the power? You see, we usually think of God as holding the power, and of course, in many ways, he does. He's the ultimate judge of hum humankind. He's the Lord of all life and death. He's the giver and taker of life. He's the sovereign over the universe. So what I'm saying is not to diminish that God is omnipotent, that he is all-powerful. But there is this glorious sense in which God has chosen weakness. 
He's chosen to love us with the deepest kind of love, a love that doesn't let go, a love that hangs on even in deep pain. Because when he chose to love human beings, he chose to love people who have not had a good history of being faithful to him. He chose to love people who don't reciprocate in kind. He chose to have a woundable heart. There's an entire Old Testament book called Hosea, which tells the story of God loving us in our infidelity. It's been described as the story of God crying. Because that's what it's like for God to love people who don't reciprocate to the same way in the same degree. It's what it's like to love people who are not always faithful and still want to do it their own way. It's what it's like to really love. To really love is to make yourself weak. I mean, even Jesus in coming to this earth in Philippians chapter 2, the Bible said he thought equality with God was not something to be grasped but made himself nothing. Jesus chooses vulnerability because Jesus chooses love. There's an inverse relationship between power and love. Jesus doesn't cling to power. He clings to love. And what he tells us is the heart of God for all time has been a lover's heart, has been one that has loved us with a kind of love that is woundable, a kind of love that can be brought to tears, a kind of love that doesn't give up, that keeps on loving us even when there's pain involved. That's the heart of our Father. And that's why he chooses the upside-down value system because he knows what it's like. And you understand now maybe why Jesus is called the Son of Man because he knows what it's like to walk as a human being in this earth, to be woundable, to be hurt like we've been hurt, to be rejected like we've been rejected, but to still keep on loving. God chooses love over power. This is why the broken and the hurting have a special place in the heart of God. This is why Christmas is all about the marginalized, and they're at the center of the story. And it's why God cares so much about what you're going through right now. Some of you right now, this is just a very painful time. You lost somebody that you loved. It's been unfair. Death is unfair. It takes from, people, it takes from us people we love no matter how much we love them. It, 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 we lose relationships where we've invested ourselves so heavily, but the other person didn't invest in the same way. Sometimes it is that at a time like this, we've just a reeling because we just heard the big C word. It's cancer. And we're not sure if we're going to see another Christmas. There's all kinds of things that happen in our life that are painful, that are unfair. Some of us in this room have been called names by people that we really respected. Maybe it was a parent. Maybe it was a teacher. And somehow that name kind of stuck. And because we were called that name for so long, it's something we default to when we blow it and we keep on calling ourselves that same name. And I'm just here to tell you that God is on the side of the lonely, the hurt, the desperate, the depressed, the weak, the addict, the broken, the ill. God is on their side. When no one else is, God is on your side because God has the heart of a lover. And he knows when people are alone. And he knows when people are afraid. And he knows when people have no other hope. And he's pursuing you. And he wants a relationship with you. And if you don't know him in a personal relationship, or you haven't trusted him with your great pain, whatever that might be, then please don't leave this room today not knowing the one who loves you like no one will ever love you. Let's pray. Father, I just want to thank you so much for the power of the Christmas story, that those on the bottom, they're brought to the top, that those at the back of the line are brought to the front of the line, because God, you care about the things that affect us, that hurt us, that wound us, that cause us to feel completely alone, like we're just not a part of what everyone else is experiencing. At this time of the year, God, may they really, for the first time, let the Christmas message take, that Lord, you love them with an unrelenting kind of love, that you want them to be reconciled to you, that Christ coming into the world was to seek and to save the lost. He came, he sought us, and he saved us. And so God, let somebody surrender to your great love today to ask you to come into their life, forgive them of their sins, give them a new hope, and give them a new future. In Jesus' name, amen.